Okay, so uh, we're going to get started since we are tight today on schedule. But I need to introduce Frank, you know, although he doesn't require much introduction, as everyone here knows Frank. But the first time I knew Frank was uh, almost, almost 40 years ago. When I first showed up at Berkeley as, uh, as a postdoc, and I remember giving a talk, uh, a seminar, and I was in the middle of my talk, you know, about some compact H2 region. So as you know, when you first learn how to give talks, one of the most important things is how to answer questions. So I was very careful, try to be non-confrontational, but always admit that you don't know something, or right? you're asked something. So Frank immediately, of course, in the middle of the talk, asked me some questions, which I couldn't answer, which then I said, well, I don't know. Let's talk about it later. And Frank was sitting like about here. He immediately jumped out at me, practically in my face, you know, and says, no, we're going to talk about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, who is this old guy who's so obnoxious attacking me as a young postdoc, right? So since then, many years have passed, and I've learned to appreciate Frank's and his style, right? So what he's trying to tell us in that point was that science is built out of urgency. You need to address the question, and you need to address the question immediately. Don't wait, right? And his style of work, you will also find that, he, as he reminds me yesterday, progress is made at the interface between theory and data, because that's how you make it relevant, right? If you are only in the data part, or you're only in the uh, theory part, you know, you can never be really relevant in what you do, okay? And then the third part, which is part of the style, as you see today, is life is all about passion. Frank is, if anything else, is passionate about his work, and you see that today. He's passionate about the environment, he's passionate about you, he's passionate about our future, and he's been telling us about astronomy, but now he wants to tell us about climate, energy in our future. So let's welcome him to give us another lesson. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've done two tours of duty in Taiwan. Uh, the first uh, uh, was in Tsinghua, and the second time I came back here, where things really all started, in some sense. I consider this a second home. And uh, I came back because uh, of this project. Uh, I was giving advice to the government. And Premier Liu says, well, this sounds very good. And Taiwan would like to support it. But there's a condition. I said, what's that? He says, you need to come back and, <laughs> and show that it's scientifically feasible. So this is my report, OK? If you see him, please tell him you thought it was scientifically feasible. So the title of the talk is Astrophysics of Molten Salt Breeder Reactors. And the subtitle is Building a Nuclear Reactor Better Than the Sun. That's just to get your interest up, OK? How can it be better than the sun? <coughs> this is a, a work of a large team of people, uh, people coming in and out of it. We call ourselves the HX team. Uh, HX means heat exchanger, because we're not really allowed to do nuclear reactors. But one of the functions of a nuclear reactor is to exchange heat okay, from the reaction to uh, useful purposes. And this HX team uh, constitutes a large number of people and was formed in 2009. Uh, it's mainly based out of Asia A. And you can see at the bottom the uh, names of uh, some familiar astrophysicists, some former postdoc at uh, Berkeley, <laughs> Paul Ho, Ruben, Ron, Dawson, and Rebecca. And then at the Institute of Chemistry, uh, he's now joined our group, Luo Fentai, Dr. Luo. Anything you see to do with experiments, he or uh, Xian Fu have uh, performed that uh, experiment. At uh, Tsinghua, uh, we have uh, Professor Tai, Tai Nianhua. Uh, who uh, knows everything about sealing uh, pores in graphite. And Bo Fu, uh, who's, is Bo Fu here? 
Kung Fu? No. Okay. Uh, anyway, he uh, started out as a uh, uh, a research assistant in Di Professor Dice. And then David Wong is uh, a uh, chemical engineer. At Etri, we have S.K. Wu. At City University in Hong Kong, we have uh, Professor C.T. Liu, who's an expert in uh, metallurgy. At University of Michigan, we have uh, Yang Zubao, uh, Ralph Yang. He knows everything about making holes in carbon. So we are both interested in carbon that's very porous and carbon that's completely tight. And in Southern California, uh, we have a uh, former classmate of mine, uh, Frank Modell, who's a chemist, and Sam Chen, who, uh, uh, OK. So the outline of the talk is I'll give a uh, discussion, to, an introduction, which starts with the primary energy consumption after emancipation by Industrial Revolution. Many people think the Industrial Revolution allowed industry to exist. That's not the most important thing the Industrial Revolution did. It emancipated human labor and substituted machine labor. That's much more important. Well, how it affected people. So it, for example, eliminated slavery. It eliminated child labor. It allowed women to enter the workforce instead of staying home to do the things that women used to do. So it's a tremendous transformation, much more important than the transformation brought about by consumer electronics, that's as important as it is, okay? Because it did those things. So our HX strategy addresses the unforeseen byproduct, which is, of course, carbon dioxide emission, because the Industrial Revolution started off by burning coal, of course. And that, today, we know is not good, but nobody knew that before. So, you know, we shouldn't try to find blame here, all right? People were Try, always trying to do their best. So uh, our strategy is to use what we call new nuclear plus biomass, not only to halt climate change, but to reverse it, and to reverse it in, within this century. That's what I want to convince you can happen. So we'll, in business speak, I'll talk about a SWOT analysis. SWOT means strength, weaknesses, opportunities, threat. One should never study any problem without understanding both the strong points and the weak points, OK? Otherwise, you're just fooling yourself. The worst person to fool is yourself. Fooling other people is bad enough. <coughs> OK, so um, let me go back. <coughs> um, so that SWOT analysis will include three, uh, four things. Safety, most important. Sustainability. <coughs> meaning resource conservation, and my definition of sustainability is that you have zero waste. If you have zero waste, it's probably sustainable. Security against weapons proliferation. And then the fourth S with the dollar sign is superiority in cost compared to alternatives. So four S's, OK? And I'll discuss climate change. And then I hope somebody will ask me what this is, because that's the HR diagram of energy change, OK? OK, so here's the annual global energy conservation after the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution really took place over here, but it really didn't get really going until about 1830. 1830 is when uh, slavery was abolished in Great Britain. Industrial Revolution, of course, started in England. Up until that time, all right, the primary, 100% of the energy came from biomass, OK? Burning wood, burning dung, OK? Stuff like that. 100% from recorded history, uh, unrecorded history until about 1830. And then <clears> the <throat> United States got in the act, OK, of abolishing slavery. And the end of that period, the United States also started burning lots of coal. So in fact, coal, you can see it coming up until today it's up here. Oil, when did oil start? It started after the Second War, uh, First World War, when the Allies dismembered what was previously 
the Ottoman Empire and divided up the Middle East. Why? For oil. Okay. So oil took off from there. And all the problems we see, you know, uh, occurs from those uh, decisions or non-decisions made at that time until it occupies this uh, sector. <coughs> Natural gas is found where oil is. Okay? Natural gas is cheap because they don't actually not looking for natural gas. They're looking for oil and happen to hit natural gas. And then if they can sell it, they sell it cheap because they make the money from oil. If they can't sell it, they burn it. So if you look at a satellite photograph of North Dakota, it's brighter than Manhattan. How can that be? Because they're flaring all that natural gas. That tells you how cheap it is. What people are doing really for this commodity. That's oil. That's really uh, very valuable. <clears throat> okay, let me see what happened here. Okay, so <clears throat> then nuclear started after the Second World War. Okay, when the U.S. turned under Franklin Roosevelt, Adams atomic power to nuclear power. And it expanded quickly, but then it kind of saturated. <clears throat> Hydro is kind of a 20th century phenomenon, and it basically expanded as much as it could until everybody damned every dam that could be damned. All right? And then the rest is biomass. You say, wait, 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 what about wind, solar, geothermal? Well, it started roughly in 1973 when the first oil crisis came to be. Immediately, President Carter in the United States put up solar panel. California constructed lots of wind turbines. It's been around since 1973, but you can't see it. In fact, you couldn't even see it here. Undetectable, unresolvable. Six exajoules in 2012 on a plot which goes to 660. So it's only 1%, 1.1% to be precise today. It's smaller than that comma. Okay, and this is what the whole world is pinning its hope on, at least when people talk about renewable energy. So, is this reasonable? Can this comma suddenly expand to take all this space in 23 years, which is what we have for reasons I talked to? It's highly unlikely. All right? Well, if it does, it needs a lot of help. And that's what I want to talk about today. Okay. So here's the uh, Keeling curve with CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa. Uh, um, and uh, it shows the carbon dioxide that's uh, in the atmosphere as a function of time. It goes up and down because plants grow in the spring, taking up carbon dioxide. They die in the fall, so it goes down. So a yearly cycle is like this. It swings up and down, roughly by about eight parts per million. <coughs> And here's the first oil crisis. You can see we were pretty low at that time. All right? This is what people considered to be safe. This is where it was today. I snatched this off. This is the latest reading you can get. It's over 400. We've seen 400 for the last time. Okay? From now on, it's all above 400 unless we do something about it. And this is safe at 350. <laughs> so. <coughs> What do we want to do? What's the purpose of our, uh, of our projects? We hope we can flatten this curve instead of letting it rise <coughs> uh, as business as usual, flatten it by nuclear energy plus uh, renewables, the ones I've already mentioned, and then at 2050 come to a maximum at 450, which is what everybody agrees is needed if we're to have a even a 60% chance to be less than 2 degrees C. We're already at 1 degree C above the Industrial Revolution. Look at all the havoc it's causing. So imagine what happens at 2 degrees C. There's going to be suffering. There's no getting around that. There's a lot of suffering. Had we begun then to do what we think should have been done, all this could have been avoided. Okay? But it isn't. So, so, and then we want to use biomass. <coughs> to lower this to 350 parts per million before the end of the century. And that is the question whether it can be done. You can see sort of what the idea must be. 
if this is what plants can do, if you could take all the plants that die and instead cause them, make them into charcoal, they don't rot. So they wouldn't go back up. All right? And then next year, you take next year's. All right? And <clears throat> all the way down, if you could do that, all of the biomass, you would go down to 350 in 12 years. You probably can't do that, right? That's a huge task. Let's say you could do a quarter of that, and it would take you 48 years. Okay, and a quarter is roughly reasonable. That's taking a big, huge effort. So why do I say uh, this? <clears throat> That's our strategy, okay? New nuclear for energy, biomass for carbon-based materials, in particular, used in a negative emissions way. So somebody responsible for all this. Who's responsible? Here's the cumulative emissions per ton per person. Okay, tons of carbon emitted into the atmosphere per person.